Okay, we're back. I know it's been a while. I'll talk in just a second. What's this thing doing? There we go. So, as you can see, I'm just firing up Crash Side again. I don't intend to make a regular thing of this, I just thought it's a very low pressure thing that's already established that I've already spoken over. Idea is just, I'm not gonna feel obliged to say anything, so, uh. Then I'll be free to just kind of talk generally, and this is just me kind of getting back into the habit of talking and uploading things. I know some people just like generally these things, and. You know, just general fans, and I guess it'll be good to have something up, and if you want to pass some time, you'll have this there, and if not, nothing I'd say really worth looking at in here. Probably it's very skippable, non-essential release, and it's not part of any series or project. I just, as I've been saying, I just want to record for the sake of recording, and this is a nice thing I don't have to worry about. This is again Halo Dig Site, Bungie's old build for when this was a PC game, and uh, yeah, Halo's just a nice thing to fire up and mess around in, nice excuse for me to sit in front of a microphone and talk, and I'll give a general update on what's going on in just a second. I think we've got a established plot again in this thing, and I am actually interested in how they set this thing up. It's very neat to me. Just this early picture of the vision and just how they arranged a scene. Very elaborate. <laughs> ah, it's just nice to get into this. There are some games I just fire them up and I feel good. For me, that's Halo. But, uh, I mean, there's guns around here. I want that. They're just Round up, boys! Who's standing? Vicente, you good? Hey, Tristan ain't looking too good, man. Yeah, so sorry. I said this would be about me, no, and I'm kind of Wake up, man. distracted right, by how right, I just find look. this game very nice, but, uh... Ammo. Scrape out the pelican. Who has yeah, the Sarah, I've been out of it for like a week. I just get it, very... But he bit it. Jeep, sorry, when they're talking, I just want to listen to them. This is much more elaborate than anything Squad, in the campaign. I it really interests me how you're like, getting orders. We're pulling back to a safe location to reach the We've got to plan our next move. Contact. If I remember right, some guys are about to run off you. That's it. Let's see what's going on. Anyway, so me, yeah, I've just been in that kind of mood, not really feeling up to much. That doesn't mean I go idle, I've been basically eating data for about a week, that's what I do. If I'm in a less than superb mood, I'll just get something into me, as much of it as I can, so I'm not idle and, you know... If I'm just getting stuff into me, it's all going into my head, making that internal cosmology picture of the world get a bit more elaborate, and you never know, something you just kind of like idly consume in a moment of leisure, that might be something that you... Those damn gun emplacements. One second. I don't like it up here. Well, someone's got to find out where we stand. You got a better idea? Yeah, we get out of here. Oh, damn. Oscar got scorched. You see the smoke? I see a banshee. Bastards. All right, I'm calling it. Let's head back. That's very neat. Sorry I got distracted again there, but I hadn't seen that scene last time. And, uh, yeah, for like a dug-up demo scene, there's some very elaborate scripting here. As I said before, it's a lot like myth, this idea that it's very, like, cinematic and the ideas you just kind of roll through it. But anyway, as I was saying, yes, just... My thing when I feel kind of low is I'll just like read manga and stuff, I'll read novels and the ideas. It's a good enough way to pass time where like I feel alright doing it, I can do it when I'm in a bad mood and I can look back upon the times having been spent halfway decently. It's something I can, you know, I'm not ashamed of it and I can potentially get some value out of it later on. I can think about what I've read and maybe it's... Looking for some interesting people, what they've got going on, what their interests are. And anyway, what have I been doing that's actually really relevant to this? I've been uh, reading some manga that's very kind of adjacent to or part of my interests. I've been um, reading. I forget the author's name, but the Golgo 13 guy. I read a little bit of Golgo 13, and I also read. Um, survival in that manga by him. That was very nice and it's um... So what's the relevant here? Well... That guy, it's... I'm 
sorry, I'm doing two things at once and not doing a very good job of it. The term that comes to my mind when I think of what's related between Halo and those manga, the term is leverage, and by that I mean, you know, human leveraging. Human leveraging, what does that mean? By that I mean, basically, entertaining experiences in applying yourself. What is survival by Saito, I think is his name. Yeah, it's just the kind of stock survival Robinson Crusoe type thing. Things go very bad when you find yourself alone in the world, and that's a very good story to people, and, and it's just something that's been on my mind. What is the appeal of the survival story? And I think that that's fairly plain. It's the fantasy of leverage, this fantasy of your kind of... It's also kind of related to the Isekai fantasy. What is the appeal of Isekai? What is the appeal of crime story. I'm going a, a bit off track, but I've been drawing connections between a few different things that interest me. That's what I've been kind of having in the back of my mind while consuming junk media. You know, I don't just kind of scan things. I... Does it make sense if I just say, like, I'm sure a few people can relate to this, but, like, there's no, like, just blank slate, just real through consuming experience. I try to appreciate in the sense that I try and kind of try to get value out of the experience of a thing, and by that I just mean think about it, think about its relationship to other things, nothing exists in a vacuum in that way. That's just how I have an interesting time with things, and there's just been kind of a natural, like, not, I don't like make a project of this, just like what's going on my mind while consuming, reading a few different things, is this notion of leverage, and by that I mean, sorry, I'm, I swear I'm going to get to the point eventually, this idea of, like, what is the appeal of different kinds of stories that we might superficially take as quite different? What do they have in common? Why do we, of all things, look into these things? Why do they fascinate us? So, particularly this idea of the survival story, and then Golgo 13, the crime story, and then also games like Halo. I think that the appeal is very much the same in all cases where, you know, who wants to be Robin Crusoe? Why do you want to be Robin Crusoe? Well. This manga sold quite well, and things similar to it, I think there are a lot of things similar to it out there, they've also sold quite well, and what I think is going on in these stories is very much it's... It's the fantasy of being taken to another world in which, again, whatever it is possible, problems are immediate and solutions are direct. Potential solutions are direct and immediate. You're able to progress and overcome in this world through direct leveraging of human qualities, traits, gifts, strengths, whatever, where it's very much in our world of today, what is the real problem with it, that a man can't leverage himself against it. Is advancement possible in the 21st century? Yes, but is satisfying advancement really possible? I would say no, that's kind of something that a lot of people probably have trouble articulating, like they say, like, oh, you're not good enough, not virtuous enough, whatever, like, really the big filter in a lot of cases, it's really just things which are not good for the person, even if they're good for your circumstances, and I think that that's a very spiritually dangerous situation to find oneself faced with, and it's very much the kind of social condition of our time, where, again, your conditions will basically be waiting, patience, tolerance for and dissatisfaction is the necessary condition to get ahead in life. That's basically what education has been turned into, is the obvious example that you can't leverage intelligence against that. It's very much just, you know, smash your head into it, do your time. It's like you're a goddamn prisoner, and eventually you'll, you know, get a bit ahead. But was it satisfying? Not really, compared to, say, like, you know, Robin Crusoe doesn't have... Robinson Crusoe doesn't have to, you know, wait. It's always very much... There is a lot wrong with his situation, a lot that could potentially be improved within his circumstances, but the fact that he can directly do that means that his life is more satisfying than yours, basically, and... That's very... The, Sa the Saito thing does not say really philosophically, like, oh, look, this guy's life is better because he lives in a crap hole, but that's very obviously, you know, like, this thing exists for a reason, and it's... An interesting story where it, like, talks about, like, the, you know, less glamorous and finer points of surviving and getting by in a tough situation, but 
it's very much presented as this kind of story of very much like a lively emotional existence. You know, the wins that you can scrape in such a situation are very big, as are the losses. It's very much up and down. It's not just like a return to some kind of like utopian idol before society ruined everything. There is a lot wrong with having to live like this, but you very much get the impression that, you know, for better or worse, this is a life which is alive again because, you know, the circumstances are just more visceral, and that is very much a way to give human life meaning. I'm not saying that's a great way to live, but there's something to be said for it, and it's very much... The idea is not that we should be returning to that, but the idea is that we should be capturing what works within that, within the modern world, and I do believe that it's not... There is an element of compromise necessary, civility will require sacrifices and patience from us for its rewards, but very much what's wrong with today, the rewards have basically been scrapped and given to people who don't work for them, if not just outright destroyed, and yeah, the ways that you can get a good deal of satisfaction out of life, or you could, they have been progressively destroyed. Like I said before, you can't leverage your intelligence against schooling. You largely, relatively could, is the impression I get in the 20th century, and this showed in the fact that people, I believe, had far more obviously tested and effective intellects 100 years ago, and also, well, yeah, I mean, they were better at thinking, and also, the caliber of person who was who could be found in higher academia and the uh, state of life they were having, it's very obvious that better people were being selected for and they were doing better in life than they are now. It's very clear that, yes, the system was working better in everything it was meant to do. It was selecting for better people, it was giving them more satisfying lives, it was allowing them to do more interesting work, which would have been more satisfying to them as well, I'm quite sure. And again, what's the problem today that, you know, what's the school education now? It's not really a test of intelligence. I'm not saying that the point should be like, oh, they aren't testing them hard enough, like, the point is to just, like, be toiling mentally, but, like, you know, the good kind of test where, like, you're actually facing situations where your intelligence can succeed or fail, and that is an interesting and compelling thing, whereas, like, I'm an academic burnout, but am I an intellectual burnout? I would say no. What do I mean by that? You may get it in the sense that I found myself meeting challenges that I couldn't overcome within academia, but they were not intellectual ones. It was more like existential ones of like, wow, this is very boring and unpleasant and I don't want to be here, and knowing that this is going to go on for years is very much crushing my will. Whereas, you know, if you're in a do-or-die situation, you are very much not facing that, wow, I don't want to be born for this long problem, it's much more immediate of, okay, like, I'm going to die, but unless I do something very coherent and visceral right in front of me, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be poor if I don't continue to live my life in this very boring, unpleasant plan. Does that make a kind of sense? An interesting thought back to this for a moment that's come to me is that what this would have had when it was a PC game, you can say this thing was kind of, this whole open area is kind of oddly structured with these awkward checkpoints. You know what it would have had back when this was made, back when it was a Mac or a PC game? It would have had auto saves, and they're interesting if you remember what I was saying about the appeal of this big open connected game as opposed to like new kind of micro scenario games. The appeal is very much that actions have consequences, what I did five minutes ago is still weighing on me now, and the interesting thing with autosaves, I mean not autosaves, quick saves, is that you can very much just tune that to your own liking in a way that I think is quite fun. And, uh, yeah, just these like three roughly big situations this level can be broken into, it would be just, when this was on the map, you like save after each one, and you do the constantly in a gunfight. It's a very elegant system, I think, for quick saving that lets you just kind of make your own challenge of it. But back to where I was, yes, the appeal of the survival thing, it's all very immediate and connected. Just what I've been saying about gunfights and this, you can kind of see, I'm sure mentally, you can see where I'm going, that um, 
Yes, like, what is the appeal of Halo? But within the bounds of this scenario, you are Robinson Crusoe. So everything you have to deal with is very immediate. I don't have to, like, mark things out on a spreadsheet and stick to a plan for weeks to get through this. What I've got to do is, it's all very immediate. The problems are immediate. What will happen if I don't deal with them is immediate. And this is... You know, why are video games irresistible to people, like good ones, bad ones, whatever, everyone likes them in general, I think that that's very obvious, what's appealing is that, just that element of leverage, that sense of like, okay, the thing that needs doing is right in front of me, my options are right in front of me, and whatever I do, it's gonna be done right now, and... Yeah, I think really, pretty much every kind of really popular fiction is tapping into that in one way or another, and especially a lot of ones we wouldn't really think of, like where I was going today with something I was writing and something I'm writing more long form, which I will get back to eventually, is this idea that crime fiction really interests me because I see it as rather like detective fiction. It's really kind of something about manners and rules rather than... You know, what is crime in, like, the social sense? Crime is about, basically, transgression against social order, but what is crime media generally? Is this media exploring transgression, or is this more like fascination with underworlds and lifestyles, where where I'm going is basically something I keep saying and not elaborating on, I keep getting distracted, is, you know, what is Isekai, like that fantasy, it's the very popular fantasy of being transported into a world which runs on its own set of rules, which are kind of ones that we can understand, there's a kind of logic and hard, there's kind of hard logic and rules and... It's very much a world of action where hard actions have hard and severe consequences as opposed to our one where you just kind of amble around doing inconsequential things and the big moves in your life are determined by basically sunk time and some very like petty social connections. The appeal of Isekai is very much like hard rules, high stakes, very clear inputs for very clear results and what is crime media? Is this about like chronically anti-social weirdos who can't stop causing problems for civil people? Is that why we watch them? Or is there a kind of like fantasy we have of that kind of life where basically they're free from what I just described. There's this fantasy of the criminal and the criminal world is the criminal is someone who is basically able to take these shortcuts, these hard visceral actions which will have drastic payoffs of one way, one kind or another within our own lives, and the criminal world is a world defined by this being the kind of general state of things in which, yeah, again, like, what is criminal, what is criminal fiction, like, what was The Sopranos to the average person watching it, I'm not saying what was it to the creators, I'm sure that, like most things, there's a very wide chasm between what it was to its Showtime! creators and what it was popularly received as, what the mass appeal was, where I'm going is, I think the average person who was watching something like The Sopranos or and eventually Breaking Bad, if you think of that, my point probably gets a lot more plausible. The appeal is that it's a kind of isekai scenario where you're transported into this. Why a lot of these stories are about initiations as well, like coming from our world into their world. It's this fantasy of like a world beneath ours which is revealed where like Okay, this is where life really happens. This is the world where, you know, people are able to live seriously and oh, severe. Oh, and go from, you know, very serious, drastic actions can okay, create okay. very That's serious, drastic changes in your life. That is the fantasy of crime fiction and Stay not necessarily something which is feel to be dead. related to. <clears throat> Not necessarily something related to the nature of crime and the reality of being a criminal. Oh, yeah, I think baby. Nicholas Winman Ruffin commented on this as well. Like, someone asked him, like, why do you make movies about criminals? And he said something to the effect of, like, okay, well, that's where, like, the drama is in there. There is. And Ruffin alternates between what are basically Whoa. explicit fantasy works and kind of harder social realism works. Like, the difference between only God forgives and Pusher. In either case, the kind of Firing. lack of differences, you might say, in those makes it, I think, very explicit what's actually interesting in these stories, that Pusher feels more like Only God Forgives than something like a crime documentary, because, you know, 
appreciate it despite the kind of using that kind of hard social realism in a sense that I can do you know, like, I've never been to the Copenhagen underworld, but from where I've never been to the captured it quite well, the kinds of people that are there and how they would speak to each other and so on. Heavy but, yeah, so what was Raffin doing? He's making a story about a very serious, high-stakes world where things actually happen, you know, that's Raffin's fascination, not the realities of being a criminal in any one place. He's interested in people and big things happening in people's lives, things being shaken up and, you know, to get a general audience and to be able to play with the kind of real characters who exist in our world, but also wanting to do a kind of big story. Crime is just sort of the easiest solution to that problem of, well, like, okay, our world is extremely kind of dull, lifeless and boring. Who are the people who are close to a closest to a lively existence, it would be the criminal element of our society, but closest does not mean that they are that. Again, it's a kind of like normal, socialized person's fantasy of criminal life, I think. That's something that Thomas777 goes into a fair bit when he talks about um, that novel he's very fond of, which I have read, Dead City, which is, it's written to be exciting and interesting, but it's probably a very, like, hard social realist work, you might say, in the sense that, like, it feels like it's very explicitly written to kind of spit in the face of people who see something kind of romantic and, you know, desirable about, like, the criminal underworld existence. It's a very dark work, and Thomas himself, I think, has referred to it as a horror work, which is a very interesting statement. I've also been writing about horror lately, so that's on my mind. Just the last thought there is that Thomas has kind of said that, like, suggested that he doesn't like that so many crime works are, like, basically not realistic, and I think that, yeah, Sopranos isn't realistic, and people who are, like, watching it for this kind of, like, vicarious thrill of, like, ooh, I'm being initiated into the dark, evil side of the world, like, no, you're not getting that, and it is right to perhaps hold that view of disdain, but I really do believe that the creators, I'm not going to name them because I'm sure I've forgotten their names but I'm getting them wrong, but the creators I think are doing kind of the rough and kind of like, okay, that's where the high stakes, lively drama can feel oh, most yeah. plausible and appropriate in the kind of modern world, otherwise modern world, and has so it rough and set. I want to play fire, baby! Content. You know, elevated, high-stakes lifestyles, the way the game is about the More of them. Generally, it's at least the easiest way, but it's a way that has Over a here. established genre history, so there's a lot that you can do with that, and it's... What the there's a lot of people who have fun with that, and... Yeah, it's worked out fairly well for my like, yeah, I, I, I haven't watched all of it, and I don't know why I'm going to sit down as it's kind of seen me long, so I haven't seen all of it, but... You know, I have nothing against it. But anyway, where was I? Yeah, so... If, Let's cri roll! if criminal fiction is really this kind of like, basically a fantasy genre, and the fantasies of the world, the media and leverage, then, yes, yeah, like, what does that say about other genres? You know, what is the appeal in all cases? Like, talk about the world, like that, and that, it's the same in everything. No our hearts are so hard, our hearts are so confused because we on one hand, our yeah, honest about what we're into, and on the other hand, we just really don't know the confused. See that? Next time you guys can help! Very, very ah. at all. Like, what do we like about the Sopranos? Do we like that it's realistic, or do we like this drama? Like, yes, that's one thing that we point out maybe. A lot of the people watching the Sopranos, they're basically people who want to watch Isakai, but, you know, there's a kind of vestigial inertia based respectability to the Sopranos, which makes it feel less like a cartoon than a cartoon that it is in the minds of people watching it. Well, in the minds of its creators, I think the oh, Sopranos is really more of a kind of operatic work where you kind of explore the entirety of the human condition through these exactly Don't bother getting up, buddy. I'll keep you things. down! There is a lot of... Rick Walden, before he vanished, he made a very interesting video about the final season of, um, the Sopranos. That's a guy on YouTube, I really like Rick Warley. He's most famous for his coverage of Star Wars, but he's done a lot of good stuff and he's gone. Hey, hey, so I've been to the list of people who's work I have to finish up this. None of the good ones. And, speaking of, I just died. 
So anyway, yes, so... Uh, <coughs> gee, that's a rough check. Oh, that's more of the... It's more of what I was saying in the last video, like, that doesn't have to be in the Far Cry 4, does it? It's very... Oh, oh, all that's that was I did just talk about the fact I'm dead. I find that interesting in the game, but... Yeah, so The Sopranos, again, I see it as this kind of, like, fantasy opera with kind of, like, Someone a lot of social realism in the world, and I think that that's really an accurate characterization of a lot of popular crime Maybe in the world. On fire. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that, we shouldn't be upset by that. End. Again, Thomas, when he talks about Dead City, that's a lot of, again, Dead still. City, it's a lot. If you want to kind of, like, ultimate look at that, turning the criminal world into a kind of genre experience, that's an interesting one, where it's this kind of, like, just creepy, ugly horror saga in which a few people have very ugly lives, but in a very mean, genuinely anti-social world. Like, you want to say crime media, which is actually about... Well, it's like, it's transgressive school against the social world. Dead City is one that I could recommend. The other one which comes to mind. In the context of the video game, actually, this is what I was starting to write about. I'll get back to it soon as well. I want to get this done. <clears throat> a friend of mine was writing about Katie for Katie and Lynch, and I wanted to write about Katie and Lynch, and he wrote a bit, I'll write a bit, but... I didn't get to it because I had to establish why I find it interesting and this just went on for pages and pages and I'm still not done. Where I was going is like, why is this thing interesting compared to say Grand Theft Auto, even though Grand Theft Auto is an entire like living city that cost a bajillion dollars to realize it. Came and Lynch is a couple of technically okay games about like running around shooting people for a few hours. Came and Lynch I think is kind of a few things like Kane and Lynch 2 I enjoy calling the Miami Vice of video games because it basically leveraged a very popular genre to make a very weird aesthetically powerful experience which was basically made to get in under the noses of popular audiences it's not what they wanted and the people making it, it knew that I find that very fascinating Miami Vice is kind of like a cool 2000s cop movie with rap music and there's a black cop and a white cop but it's actually like basically an art house movie about these like just it's just about pretty music and pretty places and cool people with no real regard for like crass notions of like badasses having action moments or anything it's all just this kind of like very thoughtful moody aesthetic exercise i find that very Pleasing, but yeah, Kane and Lynch 2 is like that, just on like a bare aesthetic level. It's quite a interesting, flashy, beautiful game with very high production values. On its time, it's about the only game at that time. If you're old enough to remember around like 2009, 2012, they were making a lot of like really crappy third person shooters that were just weightless, rapid, and pointless. I would say about the only one that's still worth looking at is probably Kane and Lynch 2 maybe Kane and Lynch 1 for a bit of context, but jeez, we had games like Spec Ops The Line, which were just more wrong than this. It was fun in that direction, like, that was fun, you stole my kill! Just, I wanted to see it because I don't know it existed, and just, I was in awe of how ugly it was. Just a viciously ugly period for video games. But anyway, yeah, Kane and Lynch 2 was fascinating on that level. But that's a less interesting one. I'm not so interested in the history of video games as like, man, monkey weapon. Too much cover shooting, not enough person. I really don't give a shit about that as you know. But, you know, what's interesting about Kane and Lynch is just the idea that people actually have that history of the game that they wanted to make. It's a very far he had all the controversy even beyond that. Kane and Lynch stands out just because that's yes, where I was going. I was writing about this leading up to Kane and Lynch, this idea that like there's lots of things that have people who are ostensibly criminals in them, but is Grand Theft Auto really a crime game? I would say no, it's a kind of it's again, it's the it's this other world where it's kind of like Okay, you're in the crime world now, where everything has different rules, nothing really has lasting consequences, and you're just in this kind of, like, ridiculous Mario funhouse with guns that happens to 
superficially look like a city. You know, they model it very heavily, but it's all very superficial, like this place doesn't really behave that coherently, whereas Kane and Lynch is smaller but deeper, in the sense they go to a lot of trouble to make their little urban areas where levels happen and feel very alive, and the idea is that like, rather than this kind of cartoon world of cartoonish logic that exists for you to just basically sow chaos with no consequences, Kane and Lynch is very much... Using a very limited, narrow focus, it's a game that's a few hours long and every level is very strictly defined in where you go and what you do. Within that very strict focus, it tries to create a very plausible picture of a social order, which you are tearing through every time you have to It's very much a criminal experience in the sense of how much fans bless like in a cartoonish world that looks like how long they can. You know, the idea that they wanted to sell like the an angle. Uh, boss, you know, the when they made the game, this idea that Whoa. you are in the real world and you are tearing it to pieces. As opposed to say Grand Theft Auto, where it's like, okay, you are alternating between like cartoonish Crash Bandicoot America, where you just South Park America, where you just blow things up and it's all just chaos and a bit of fun. And then the story, which is a crime story where it's like basically this fantasy realm of factions and interest groups who are free to just violently conspire against each other with a wider social order which would constrain us. being pervaded as criminals do while well, the game, it's more of it just doesn't exist. Cops oh, don't oh, exist in Red Dead Auto until right, like, yeah. you need an enemy oh, yeah. for a oh, yeah, level just a little more. Whereas Kane and Lynch, it's very much like, it's the world of like, people who have social obligations One alien down. everyone does things to hold the peace and make it all work. And then you're this deranged anti-social element just blowing through the middle, tearing people apart. It's very... it's very shocking in a way that Grand Theft Auto can't really be, oh, even when it tries, and it's very entertaining on that level, I think. Just... it's a very unique experience, is how I'll put it. That's... That's why Kane and Lynch 2 and 1, I guess, as well, I'll be nice and say 1. That's why these are games which I would say are actually of lasting historical interest Whoa! despite their age and despite them superficially of like Dead. the most boring type of game ever. It's just like greatness and really take cover behind stuff and fire assault rifles. That part is unfortunately how you experience the game now, and that part is kind of boring. It's like the vapid talking scenes in most of the subjects. Okay, it's doing that part, and you've got to do it to get to the cool part. The audiences have expectations, and they don't have good expectations. These have to be respected, that's just part of being a popular working artist. And, you know, that's how I see it in the match, too. It's like, my own advice, it's an interesting place of a very striking aesthetic vision. Some rather mundane and stark genre expectations and standards. Again, probably the most remarkable and beautiful thing to come out of this game. Not particularly the genre. Miami Vice was working within a better one, but still, like, how many movies from the 2000s do you want to go back and watch? Not many. How many video games do you want to play from around when the game 2 came out? I would say, even four. I would say it was a really horrific time for games. You know, as I'm always saying, the horrific time started in 2008 and it hasn't stopped since. We're in a very bad, bad time. Yikes. But, yeah, that vision, that idea Showtime. of that world of actual crime, that's something that games have done very few times, and it's why that one is interesting. And yes, why is... Why are most crime games not really crime games? Because they're Halo. They're just this kind of, Step out of it. world based I'm ready. on there it is. action. They're action fantasies, basically, is how I would put it. They're a world by Halo, and they've contrived a world in which it makes sense to be constantly having gunfights. Bungie's idea of a world of violence and strife was this world of humanity waging a war for its existence, nice and, and you know, Rockstar Games thought they would sell you in New York and just have you know, constantly be blowing people up Park in New because that's fine. I hope you bought some butter, it's about to get fried! <clears throat> 
to bring it back to the more broad point, which I'm always going into, did, is there really more going on in Halo than just like a contrivance to enable these constant violent experiences which are satisfying as a human? You know, this will immediacy of questions of violence and survival. Violence is just like the ultimate fun problem solving exercise. Want some more? It's like, that's obviously the baseline that is what that exists, is. but if you really look into the broader stuff which goes on, which is going on around here, which you can use to kind of piece together Bungie's more. There's no running! Bungie Whoa. put a lot more thought into all of this than they needed to, and um, and how do I put this? Halo, I think, is very striking because in addition to just being a very good, fun, solving yeah. problems with violence Ooh. arena, in addition to that, it's very much a kind of, what I said about the Sopranos before, on like, there's like levels of, of in which you can Punch read it. this thing, and the kind of highest level, if you were able to see it, is that Halo is this kind of meditative, operatic exploration of the human condition through this violent arena, and how much can you explore through a story which is just space marines fighting aliens so humanity doesn't get blown up. Quite a bit, actually, if you really respect the idea that Bungie are intelligent people and they had a lot of, like, really high ideas, they were very idealistic about what video games could do. If you really respect them on that level, then you'll be able to find a lot of threads of really interesting thoughts, and what I've found is every time I've pulled on one, I've found more, which is to say, none of the stuff that I see here is coincidental, it's all very obviously by design. Bungie had a lot more in, in mind than let's create a fun world of bouncy jeeps with rocket launches on the back where you blow up the and you scream like monkeys. It's very much like they had the idea even like that of like they're going to create like the last fun bouncy bouncy a good time. I talk it into a lot of the to drop attention onto this. If you watch Commander Wars videos on YouTube about these marathon games, you know, I have very mixed feelings on marathon for a lot of reasons, but it's good that those videos exist because they just make it very plain that Bungie are extremely ambitious and always have Showtime! been within forms that were not very respected. What was that? They were, like, marathon is like half of the end, half the first person shooter when most people the extent of their ambition was let's make a Doom but wake up, mate, come on, wake up. And say Doom. What's going on? And then Bungie are thinking like, okay, we're going to make a hard science fiction novel embedded within a shooting game and it'll be good. And I think that they went much further with Halo where it was like, no, Halo is about like playing a philosophy and that philosophy is Watch out! what I've been kind of what? talking where? in circles around this whole time with the whole like Okay, what is crime fiction? What is survival fiction? It's this fiction of like immediacy in the world of consequence. And Halo is very coy about this, but Halo is very deliberately a world of consequence. And by world of consequence, you know, I mean like Refn and so on, like they kind of flip around between being kind of fantasy and kind of social realism as an aesthetic. And, Halo is obviously very fantastical, we're in outer space and we're fighting aliens, but I think that Halo spiritually makes very few, if any, concessions. Hey, have you seen my other marine? Never mind. Anyway, how do I put this exactly? I've talked in such broad circles I'm having trouble finding myself now. I might just have to start again, if you'll forgive me. Um, Halo is an... Uh, it wanted to be the kind of... It's an yeah! inspiration of... Hey! It's an exploration of violence as a kind of satisfying, inherently satisfying human activity because of the total capacity to leverage yourself against problems, which is a which is provided Showtime. by basically the demands of the existential threat of someone who is going to use violence against you until you are dead. You are suddenly in the like, you know, anything goes, it's all high stakes situation, and when you find yourself within that, it's. You know, the fact that so many games are made about that, there is something inherently satisfying about combat, obviously, and it's, back to what I said, is unsatisfying about career and academia and so on, the fact that you can't really leverage anything real, like a natural human strength, which we are satisfied when it gets out, out of us, but the main context, you know, violence, it's like an ultimate test of 
physicality, strength, thoughtfulness, planning, uh, social elements, all of that going on. All of that going on to a great degree in Halo, but at least a fair bit of it, and I think that that's why this is inherently fun, just bouncing around in here. It's, it's a problem-solving exercise, and it's very natural, very intuitive in the sense that, like, I'm not playing with hard variables in a game like... Like, a game like Hearts of Iron 4 I find very alienating because, you know, just the... There's no real harmony between the different parts. It's unsatisfying for the same reason like modern academia is or a desk job is. There's like a very little visceral connection between a problem and what I, the part of myself which I'm using to overcome it. Whereas here, it's very much like think, do, react, overcome, very immediate, very satisfying. And now, so where I was going before is that Yes, Bungie understood this well enough to build a game around it, but more than that, they understood this well enough to write a game about it. And, you know, what is Halo about? It's basically Starship Troopers, but much more right-wing. You know, there's just this whole jingoistic attitude within this game of, like, isn't it great to be a soldier? Aren't we having a fun time? This is a fun life we've been given. Obviously, it's appealing because you bought the damn game. But beyond that, if you actually look into the novels, and again, I, since Marathon was such a text-heavy work, it would be kind of silly to consider Halo's novels superfluous, and let me tell you, like, they did put a lot of work into those novels, getting them right, they hired a good guy, and were really advising them closely, and one of the actual key Bungie developers himself actually wrote, wrote one of these novels as well, they were very much... They had these fine details of the work in mind while making them. And if you basically read Halo as a multimedia work, not just in the sense of like, oh, it's a thing you look at, it has signs and music and you play it, but like, no, you see like the novels as a part of the work and the video game is kind of the centerpiece, but these novels are a kind of essential part because they don't just like start the work, they enrich it, they make it plain of Bungie, put more of themselves into that. If you take all of it together, what's going on is much clearer, and what's going on is very much a Starship Troopers style story in which violence is not just like a fun thing to do with a game, like they're very aware of why it's fun, because it's kind of the ultimate enfranchising opportunity for humanity. It creates more opportunity for more people than anything else to fully put themselves into something and fully become human, basically, by you know, what is, com what is combat? What is a fight for survival? It's a situation which calls for you to leverage everything you have to win or lose. You know, you've got the force multiplier of stakes paired with the, you know, sheer thrill of how much of yourself you put into the thing. This is a... You know, I should just skip to the thing that the novel does, which is most obvious. The, the story of the Master Chief, the guy in the green armor in the, on the cover of the box that I am playing here, in an older incarnation, of course, is... The story Bungie wrote, it would be considered probably quite edgy and politically incorrect today, is that... Humanity knew that it had some rough times ahead in the future, and they had to do some shady stuff to kind of give themselves an edge. And what they decided to do was they decided to kidnap a bunch of children and create a generation of what are just like these mana bund indoctrinated super soldiers who are, you know, on one hand, you know, he's a cyborg man, he's got all this crazy biological testing going on to make him much, much stronger. And then on the other hand, though, like what really makes him different is, you know, from childhood to adulthood, constant training, constant hardening, and... Something I found funny is that the uh, word indoctrination is used in a very neutral sense in the novel. Again, very politically incorrect, like this idea of like, okay, time for their indoctrination, they'll be ready when that's done. It's not presented as, again, something I've written about before. The Halo TV show did, because it was written by women and stupid people, was it decided the story of these guys had to be a tragedy, like, oh no, they don't get to... I don't know, go to therapy and get shit jobs and watch friends when they get home. You know, like these people, they're like blood brothers who would die for each other. They're at the peak of human physical capacity. Their lives have like, you know, ultimate meaning. It's do or die for the whole human race. And they're able to do more than just about anyone else alive to influence the outcome of that. You know, constantly thrown into these insane high-stakes situations in which they're able to 
again, just have like the most interesting experiences the universe can offer. It's very much like, in the show they say like, oh, it's all repression of emotions, it's all like, I think they even literally gave them like, they said like, oh, look how bad it is to get people to do this, you can try to put a computer chip in them, it suppresses their emotions, and I was like, no, in the novels they wrote, and in the games it comes out of it too, like, the Master Chief is very emotionally aware and switched down. There is no, like, weird F-scale self-repression going on with him. He's a very well-adjusted and fairly happy guy, and so are all of them. Like, they're very serious and professional, but, you know, it's just... They've got jobs to do. These people, like, they can smile a bit, they can have friends and talk to each other, they can socialize, they're well-adjusted, and I would say it's kind of a desperate projection on the part of the show's writers to say, like, oh god, you must have to be so suppressed to basically live in what was the most respectable human profession for most of human history, like, obviously no, like, the allusion to Spartans is very obvious, this idea of, like, yeah, it's a manor bun, that's a very rich and beautiful way to live, this, again, it's the, it's humanity's oldest prestige, kind of, like, prestige occupation and the most, like, rich and desired way to live your life for most people for most of history and it's bungee revived in this context so you would either see it with fresh eyes or miss it entirely and I think bungee were obviously they had to point this out directly so that they are quite happy to get one over you and just have you not noticed this but it's very much there and what Bungie is saying with Halo again like the war game the violence game to end all of them is like, yes, they're saying, like, the appeal of video games, and especially violent ones, is that, like, Whoa! again, violence is the ultimate arena for human leverage, you know, like, again. it's not crime, it's not this is how fantasy world, well, actually, that's basically what this is how it is, but bringing it back into, like, grounding it in real history in a way most people are afraid to, like, the most satisfying human existence is to be just, you know, the Bronze Age warrior, like, you know, idiots associated with the BAP circle on Twitter, I hate all of them, they'll say, you know, video games are lame, like, no, video games, they, they produce all, video game fans produce all, so many cool people, people who grew up on these things for a reason, like, this is the closest we can get to, like, the cool parts of history, the things men can do that made life not completely boring and pointless, and, Halo is very much a story about that, very self-consciously. If you, I think if you're a halfway intelligent person and you read the novels, you will see very clearly that this is what they're going for. Like, Halo is very much a story of violence as, like, a means of enriching human existence kind of story. And it's very, as you, can, as you can see just from, like, how it's been popularly received over time, this went over everybody's heads. They were pretty good at being subtle about Let's this. Go. And, I'm sorry, my line of thought just got very disturbed by how long it took me to talk in circles around all of this, but... Yes, to bring it back to the comparison to that moronic TV show, yes, it's very much like... A typical, like, kind of, you might say, liberal-minded person of the 21st century would think like, Oh god, there had to be something seriously wrong with those people who were okay with, like, joining war bands and pillaging and destroying other human populations and willingly defying death, throwing themselves into extreme danger over and over again, but like, yeah, what they would say to you is like, oh god, there must be something very wrong with these people who not only don't do that, but I can't imagine why one would do that, and yeah, Halo is very much a story about reconnecting with that, like, you know, it's a story about people who become humanity's happy van vanguard by being initiated into this revived lifestyle and it's very good for them and good for the world it's a way of kind of yes bringing out the best in human nature and again the fact that it's a video game that everyone buys suggests that Bungie were onto something you know like Halo is a story about child soldiers happily embracing war as this kind of enfranchising and liberating th experience and just being utterly fascinated with the opportunity to you know, engage in these violent situations, and yeah, it's a video game about that, and the, the content and the message are one and the same in a way which is only really matched in something like, well, probably a lot of Japanese works, but Metal Gear Solid comes to mind where, like, Liquid Snake says, you enjoy the killing, 
And, you know, if you're at the end of Metal Gear Solid, you played your way through an entire murder simulator, so how are you gonna, you know, rebut that? You can't. And then Halo, you know, it's a game that says, like, hey, gee, like, it's basically the sundown ideology of, like, are you sure that, like, kids don't deep down, like, every boy doesn't just want to become, like, one of the 300 Spartans or a Roman century or whatever the hell? And, yeah, like, people could say, like, if they learned about the story's context, like, they'd be like, oh, god, that's horrible, like, think of it, they're, like, forcing children to wage war, but, you know, the history of Halo is, like, a media property and how successful it is is, like, you know, you just build it and they will come, like, if it were an option, the, like, child indoctrination warrior camp, it's just open to children in the first world, open to boys, and, you know, the option is presented, like, okay, you can go to school or you can go to this, like, camp where they're going to turn you into like a mana bund killing machine what do you think boys all over the world are going to pick you know like the sales speak for themselves they picked halo they wanted more halo in their lives the existence of halo raises interesting questions about the human condition i think it's a very clever very worth thinking about piece of science fiction it's very very goddamn clever. Bungie were very intelligent and thoughtful people, and you should respect them and yeah, be very into the idea that they were very serious when they were making this thing. They had a lot going on, a lot in mind. This is very much an unsurpassed work in a lot of ways. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm a bit distracted. I'm firing a again. Yeah, I didn't mean to make this like a lecture or anything, that's just on my mind. Oh. As I said, this gets me thinking about things, and that's just like, you know, it's not a week's worth of stuff, and I'm not spent a good of hours, but just get some stuff on my mind, and I just want to get some more microphones on my mind, and I can do for me just talk a bit more. Because, and again, I've just been kind of like, feeling a bit low and idle, I haven't been up to much, and I thought, yeah, let's sit in front of the microphone and talk a bit more, it's good for me, I think. It feels good to get stuff out, and it's good, I think, to just... Yeah, talk about media, be the change I want to see in the world, intelligent thoughts. I hope that, again, like, don't watch this if you want, like, you know, a hard point-to-point -point subject, but if you just want someone kind of talking around video games, again, I'm being what I'd like to see. I'd like it if there was something on YouTube if I'm kind of tired. I just want to put something on, like, okay, where is the, like, thoughtful person talking generally about video games? It's all, you know, idiots and psychos and lunatics. Where are the... Where is the just, like, normal, relaxed, hours, one-sided conversation about a video game? I can't find it. If you know where it is, really, I'm serious. Like, drop a comment and let me know. That might fill some time when I'm tired and not feeling great and just want something to put on. But yeah, back to the subject for a minute. I really respect the hell out of Bungie, and I think that Halo is a lot of things, and a framing that I think should be is a good shorthand for what I was just talking about is that Halo is a very deliberate and self-aware kind of Western counterpart to Metal Gear Solid. It is the kind of total multimedia work of art where the game and the creative intention are both very elaborate, like top of the field realization, and more than that, there is like a perfect harmonization between what they're saying, what the creative intention is, and what they have you doing. I think that that's really the... probably the most interesting thing that you can do with a video game, and it's quite hard to do. You know, one or the other is very difficult. Making a game which is just exactly what you want it to be, and extremely enjoyable for an intelligent person over a long period of time. That's one thing, you know, building the system that works and is fun. And then the other, you know, being creatively interesting, not being a moron, having interesting things to say. Yeah, who can do both of those? Who has successfully managed to... Sorry, I don't want to watch these guys. Play. But yeah, like, who has successfully managed to mirror, like, an excellent tutorial system with... You know, a... Sorry, an excellent game system with a thoughtful and interesting creative vision is where I guess I was going, the simple way to put that. Not many games, and I would say most of them are Japanese that have, but yeah, um, Halo is definitely up there. And if you've watched all the way to the end, let me quickly rattle off a few other games that I think have. They might be ones I'll talk about or play in the future. Dead Rising and Pikmin. 
Have you ever thought seriously about those games? I have, and I rank them up with these ones I've talked about. And I might elaborate on them in the future. Now I'm pretty sure this thing crashes when it ends, so I think I'll just cut this here. Thanks for watching, and I'm happy to be doing this again.